Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar organized by JetBrains. I'm Paul Everett, PyCharm Developer Advocate, and I'll be your host. The topic for today's webinar is three paradigms for method inheritance. Object-oriented programming can seem complex. You know, Python makes it a little bit easier. Inheritance can seem even more complex, but there are really only three ways to think about inheritance. In this talk, in this webinar, we will show you what those are, how they work, and how we implement them in Python. I say we, but really I mean our guest, full-time Python trainer, fellow Python oldster, Reuven Lerner. Reuven teaches courses at companies in the United States, Europe, Israel, India, China. That list might get longer in the coming years as well as to people around the world via his online courses. Welcome, Reuven. Thank you, Paul. Great, great to be here. Really fun to be with you folks all around the world watching us and uh, with everyone from JetBrains and PyCharm. Um, so today, uh, you want me to continue? I'm sorry, I'm like forgetting all great. Uh, yeah, How we'll, we doing yeah <laughs> let me go through this and then we'll hand sure, it over sorry. to you and you'll do, you'll do a little bit of setting the scene. Um, Ruben and I have known each other for a long time. It's fun for you. It's fun for me. Uh, being a, an oldster means you and I can yell at all the kids. Uh, your bio, <laughs> this is the part that's really interesting to me. Your bio says you created one of the first 100 websites in the world just after graduating from MIT's computer science department. I knew you, I guess, a couple of years after that from your Linux journal days uh, when we first met. When and what was that website? So I was really involved with the student newspaper at MIT. I was the editor in chief and done all sorts of writing and editing for them. Um, and uh, just around the time as I graduated, uh, someone came back from going to a seminar and he said, listen folks, I was at this seminar by this guy named Tim Berners-Lee and he invented something he's calling the World Wide Web. I think this is gonna be big. We should get in on this. Uh, now, we had already set something up. Like, I know this is going to sound odd to a lot of you, uh, shall we say, youngsters, but the internet and the web are not the same. And so there were all sorts of services on the internet that were that preceded the web. And we actually set something up. Uh, you might remember, Paul, this thing called Waze, a Waze server. Yes. That people could Go find for us and Waze were the two yes. things competing with the web at the time. And then the web just like sort of washed them away uh, oh, pretty, yeah. pretty quickly. <laughs> so we set up the uh, web server, like we downloaded a little Perl script and we set it up so that it could read all the archives of the newspaper, which we converted from Quark Express into this newfangled thing called HTML using mm -hmm. like serial cables and all sorts of crazy, crazy stuff. Um, and once we got it online, then we had two things to do. One was tell the world about it. So we did what everyone still does nowadays when they have a new website, which is emailed Tim Berners-Lee and asked him to put on the list of all the websites in the world. I'm sure that's that's what he spends all this time doing. And the second thing is we actually had to tell the students at MIT how to access it. So we actually took out full page ads like in our own paper, we use the space, telling them this is a browser, this is how you use a browser, um, which like seems rather quaint nowadays. And it went on from there. And like we became, yeah, the first newspaper on the web and one of the first hundred sites, which is kind of fun. So uh, first, who was that person who came back from the uh, seminar? All right. So that was uh, Jeremy Hilton, who was a, a co-conspirator on the newspaper and all this stuff. And for a very long time, a core developer and contributor yeah. to Python. He was like one of the original gang of, I don't know yeah. how many it was. He was one of the CNRI gang. Yep. Okay. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to do a oldster cage match question. Trivia <laughs> okay. question. Either. We did not prepare this. <laughs> What what does Waze stand for? Wide Area Information System. Damn. From Brewster Kale. All right, let's shift gears to the webinar. Today, you're going to go over object orientation in Python, something that goes back to the beginning of Python. You do a lot of instructing on this. Tell us some of the things that you do out in the real world, professionally, and community teaching. So my day-to-day -day job is going, used to be physically, now it's typically online with you know, WebEx or Zoom or something, but doing corporate training. So companies bring me in to teach their people. And I do, I have like 15, 16 different courses, everything from Python for non-programmers. So you have these people who need to learn programming, they need to learn Python, we get them up to speed all the way up to advanced uh, level workshops um, where we talk about everything from data science to decorators to design patterns to just practice workshops, like get, you know, sort of learn more. So that's my like day-to-day -day stuff. 
I also have a whole bunch of, I think it's now like 25 courses that I sell online as video courses. And sometimes companies like mix and match. So like they'll get a video course for the people and then I'll do Q and A with them. Um, and that's like, you know, my, my paid work. And then I also do a whole lot of community stuff. I have a YouTube channel, I tweet a lot. Uh, I have a newsletter that I send out now to about 20,000 people a, a week with um, a new Python article every week. Similar, it's funny you mentioned Linux Journal. So I had a column there for 20 years. It's similar in style, because it's still me, and in content to what I was doing in my, uh, in, in my column. So every week you get a new article about Python, Git, software engineering, something like that. Yeah, and I really recommend this. Uh, it's really good content. It kind of has this serial format, uh, you know, certainly on Twitter. And for companies, you know, you can't hire Python people fast enough. And so you're hiring people who aren't there yet for some of the Python basics. And your course is really, the way I describe it to people is your courses kind of teleport people into the future when they've moved from beginner to intermediate dev. Would you describe it that way? Yeah, I mean, you have a lot of people, so you're right. You know, companies can knock enough Python people, they're hiring like mad. And so what they end up doing is taking experienced developers. Uh, typically my students know C, C++, Java. And at the beginning they're like, oh, well I can just figure out Python because it's such a simple language. But it turns out it has depth and it has its own idioms and it has its own way of doing things. So trying to bridge that gap um, mm -hmm. and sort of get them what I call like speaking Python without an accent. Um, and so we, we go through all sorts of stuff and you know then they can actually jump into their work teleporting to their work, I like that term, and then have fewer obstacles to getting things done day to day. Absolutely. Speaking Python without an accent, especially for people coming over from Java, that's an important thing. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, we already have a question from Sebastian about the newsletter. He said, it sounds great. How do they get it? You can go to betterdevelopersweekly.com and sign up. It's called, I call it better developers because we're always all trying to become better developers. Yeah. I mean, I literally every day in class, someone asks me a question, I don't know the answer. I get to look it up and I get to learn it. And here's a little professional secret. The next time I teach, I can state that as an established fact and sound like a genius because they don't know what the previous class asked me and I didn't know. Uh, and on Twitter, it's pretty simple. Reuven M. Learner, right? Indeed, right, indeed. So. So easy, easy to find. Okay, with that set up, let's have some fun. Switch over to my slides. All right. Uh, we like to, obviously, we <laughs> like to make this webinar as conversational and live as possible. Uh, you and I could go on for days in the intro <laughs> part, but we'll try not to. Uh, so should you have any questions or problems during the webinar, please feel free to ask them at any time during the presentation using the chat in YouTube. Uh, you can see my eyes looking over sometimes. That's me looking over. Sometimes I type things in. Uh, we'll have a few pauses during the webinar where Ruben will answer your questions. Uh, we, the PyCharm team, me and others, will also answer questions as well right there in the YouTube chat. Please don't wait until the end of the talk. If you got a question, go ahead and ask it. I make this joke every time. I'm almost like 95% winner on this one. Usually the most important, the first question is, is this webinar being recorded? I joke about this because I'll say this. And five minutes from now in the chat, somebody will ask if this is being recorded. Yes, it's currently recording and the recording will be available kind of immediately in the YouTube channel, in the whole YouTube way. Uh, but we will also announce the recording later on our blog and our Twitter. All right, now that we're all set up, let's begin. Ruben, over to you and your screen. Give us a tour of method inheritance in Python. Sure thing. So object-oriented programming has been around for quite some time. And for a really long time, I feel like it was just, pe people were sort of struggling over the uh, under the weight of it. Like they felt like, oh my God, I've got to do all this work in order to get objects to work. And why? What's the benefit? And the benefit at the end of the day is easier maintenance of your code. That's the whole point. We're, we're sort of repackaging, rejigging our code so it's easier to maintain. And one of the key ways that we can maintain our code more easily is if we don't have to write it, if we can reuse code that's already there. And we see that all the time, right? So, you know, we have the, the dry rule, don't repeat yourself, right? So if I have, you know, code, so if I have several lines that repeat themselves, I can use a loop, 
And if I have you know, the same code several times in a program, I can use a function. And same code several times in multiple programs, I can use a library, or as we call it in Python, a module. And if I have the same code in several objects, I can use inheritance. So that's the whole idea of inheritance there. And I want to show you that at the end of the day, there are only a few ways to really use inheritance, at least when it comes to methods. And this all comes down to understanding how Python does it and what Python is doing with it. I want to add, though, that I teach a lot of people who come in uh, to Python, as I said, from other languages. And they often have taken university courses in object-oriented programming. And I don't know how this happened, but it's basically been beaten into them that inheritance must be used everywhere. Like, if you have two classes, clearly one inherits from the other. And that is just, like, not the case. So, like, one of my favorite examples is to have people, you like, create an ice cream scoop class and then an ice cream bowl class. And the scoops go in the bowl. Well, someone nearly every time will be convinced that the scoops inherit from the bowl or the bowl inherits from the scoop. And that's just not the case. So where do we use inheritance? Inheritance means, means one class is a another class. Now, what is that? Is a is like a computer science-y term for one thing is another thing, right? This, this shows you how creative computer scientists are. We have is a, and we have another relationship called has a. Okay, fine. So they're not grammar experts, but at least they're good programmers. So what we can say is like, you know, a truck is a vehicle, right? Or a bowl is a, you know, is a, you know, serving thing. I don't know. I can't, I don't know what bowl would be. Right, it's not exactly silverware, right? And so, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, um, you know, a table is a furniture, right? And a newspaper is a you know, publication. You can think of all sorts of things like this. And so, the idea with this is a relationship. If you can construct a sentence like this, okay, it's not really a sentence, but if you can construct a, a pseudo phrase like this, then you can say, aha, this thing here on the left should be a subclass of that thing on the right, and that's what we should be thinking when it comes to inheritance. Okay, enough theory, let's write some code. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use like one of the most well-worn examples in object-oriented programming, and we'll try to give it some Pythonic twist so you can see. So let's say my boss comes to me and says, we have a requirement in the field for a person object, right? And every person has a name, strange but true, every person has a name. And I say, boss, you got it, I'm on it. So I say class person, and I'm gonna create a new class. That's to say a new data type. Now, do I need to do this? Well, I mean, aside from the fact that my boss told me to, no, I don't need to do this. I can use string, dictionary, some combination of these built-in uh, um, you know, classes. The point of creating my own new class, though, is to give me semantic power, that I can start thinking in terms of a person. So imagine when you're driving your car, you don't want to think about all the parts of the car. You can't think of all the parts that are moving and you know, interacting there. You also want to drive. You want to concentrate on the car as one piece. And the same way, if we have to concentrate on all the little pieces, then we'll never get anything done. So classes allow us to go up a level of abstraction and not think about all the little things. But of course, when we create the class, we actually need to think about it. So I'm going to say class person. I'm going to say def in it. Self, here we go. Self name. And I'm going to say uh, self name equals name. Fantastic. So every person will have a name. And in it, I just want to stress, by the way, in it is not a constructor. People often coming from other languages are like, oh, that's where the object's created. It's not. This is what we call the initializer. The in its job is to add attributes to the new object. And the new object is self. And if people are confused about this, we can talk about this later as well. But basically, in its job is to take the already established object, put attributes on it before it's returned to the person creating it. And let's be a little friendly. So we'll say def greet, and we'll say self. And then we'll say here, return uh, hello self.name. And this is another one of those things that drives people bananas in object-oriented programming in Python, that self is explicit, and that's because that makes the scoping really, really obvious. I don't ever have to guess, hey, is self a magic word that's before local variables or after local variables? Before global variables, it's a local variable. It's a local variable just like everything else. And the attributes on my object, for example, name, they're not available as variables. We don't have that sort of uh, uh, you know unclear issues. It's name that belongs to self, and self is our object. Fantastic, congratulations, it's a person. And I can say p1 equals person, name one, because I'm super creative, and p2 equals person, name two. And then I can say print p1 greet, and print p2 greet. So what's gonna happen now when I run this code? Shockingly, it will say hello, name one, and name two. 
Why? Because we first create our new person objects. And this is an instance of person name one, instance of person name two. And then I call the greet method on P1, and I call the greet method on P2. Fantastic. And I'm feeling great about myself because I just you know, wrote a whole bunch of code. And so I'm happy. My manager's happy. All is good. And while I'm like sitting relaxing and you know, checking out stuff on Twitter and so forth, um, my manager comes and he says, good news, bad news. The good news is people love this code that you wrote. The bad news is, you know, those customers, they want more. They want more. They also want to have an employee class. They want to be able to take care of not just people, but they want to be able to take care of employees. And, and most employees are people. So we're going to just sort of make that you know, assessment, you know, assertion here that employees are just like people. And he says, the way we want to implement this is that an employee is just like a person with one exception, that the employee also has one additional attribute. And that attribute, as all of you know in the business world, that attribute is the most important thing to every employee out there, namely their employee ID number. So I say to my boss, you got it. I'm on it. I'm going to do this employee class. And my boss says, how long do you think it's going to take? And I say, about a month. He says, sounds very reasonable. My boss walks away and I think, I'm a genius. He thinks it's going to take a month. And I'm going to use the oldest programmer trick in the book, copy and paste. So I'm going to take my person class and I'm going to paste it here. And now I'm going to say employee. Oh, no, it's control D. I told you earlier I do that all the time. OK, that's employee. And then we'll say here, employee, and it takes an ID number. And I'm going to say here, self ID number equals ID number. Fantastic. And then we'll ignore grid. And now I'm going to say here, well, let's do E1. I'll stop that. And E2. And then we'll say here, this is going to be an employee. And this is also going to be an employee. And we're going to say here, say amp1 and 1 and amp2 and 2. And now I can say print e1 greet and print e2 greet. And look at that. I have my employee class in it here. Um, basically, it's self, as always, a name and ID number. We're going to set those two attributes. Greet is going to be the same. e1, e2, all good. I run this thing. Oh, all right, okay, P1, what did, I, uh, what did I do wrong? Oh, I guess it's still on like the debugger here. Let's get rid of that. Let's try this again. Oh, I think I pressed the wrong thing. There we go. Okay, and sure enough, hello, name one, hello, name two, hello, imp one, hello, imp two. And I am just feeling great. And again, I told my boss it was going to take a month. So I now have all the time in the world to play whatever games I want, go for a long lunch, and so forth. A month later, my boss comes by. And as you know, all managers of software companies inspect the code of their employees. And my manager looks at my code and he says, why did I spend so much money on your training as a Python developer? I say, what, what's wrong? It, it's, it works, right? My boss says, it works, but why didn't you use inheritance? I say, oh, right, inheritance, good point. Give me another month, I promise I'll have this worked out. My boss says, fair enough, you got it. So now I have to like, you know, scratch my head and figure out what I'm gonna do here. Now, again, the whole point of inheritance is that one class is another class. It is a type of another class. So we can say that employee is a person. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say employee, and I'm going to put in parentheses here, person. What does that do? And this is one of the key points here. What does that really mean? Well, you have to remember, again, that we have two different types of storage in Python. And, and in my opinion, people don't talk about this enough because it's so incredibly important. But we have variables and we have attributes. Variables are the things without dots before their names. So E1, E2, P1, P2, even person and employee, those are all variables. And those are looked up. So variable lookup is what we call LEGB, meaning local and closing function, global and built-ins. But attribute lookup, and attributes are the things with dots before their names, completely and utterly different, absolutely positively different. And those, I use the uh, initials ICPO, stands for first the instance, then the class, then the parents, and then object, right? The ultimate object in hierarchy. I'm gonna explain all this in a bit, don't you worry. Or, or if you prefer, worry. Anyway. What we've got here then is we have this class employee that inherits from person. What does that really mean? It means that when I ask for an attribute on my instance, it will first check to see, it will, it will eventually get up to person. 
tell you what, let's go back for a moment. Let's go back, let's take off person and let's see how it works without that. And then we can talk about it in greater depth. So when I say here, let's even do this. If I say like, for example, print E1, you know, let's even go back to person for a moment. If I say here, print key1.name, will that work? Can I get the name that way? Let's try it, we'll run it. And sure enough, I have the name printed out here, name one. How did that work? Well, name is an attribute on P1. So Python turns to P1 and says, hey, P1, do you have an attribute name? And the answer is absolutely I do. How do we know this? Because earlier when we created P1, self was this alias inside of greed for, for P1, and we added the attribute name to self. So we created P1, we added that attribute. Remember, that's what uh, in it does, added the attribute, comes back, now name is on P1. So far, so good. But then we said P1 greet. How did that work? Python turns to P1 and says, do you have the attribute greet? The answer is no. The attribute greet is not on P1. Rather, the attribute greet is on person, on our class. And this is one of those weird things that takes a while to get used to, but classes are objects in Python just like everything else. And so a class is not just a blueprint describing the objects we're gonna create. Rather, it is an object itself. It's like a container object, a factory object. So Python turns to be one that says, do you have the attribute greet? The answer is no. But then it doesn't give up. Python doesn't give up so fast. Who does it turn to? Let's scroll down here a little bit. We're gonna see. After the instance, it checks on the class and it says, okay, if you don't have this attribute greet, I'm gonna check on your class. Sounds like I'm gonna tell your parents. I'm gonna check on your class. Does your class have the attribute greet? And the answer is yes. So we get back the greet method object and then with the parentheses, we invoke it. So far, so good. And the same thing happens so far with E1 and E1 greet, right? So, so far, so good. We set E1 you know, as all the stuff, E1.greet, E2.greet, all good. When I say, let's say I ask for an attribute though that does not exist. We're gonna check on the instance, we're gonna check on the class. Then that's basically it, except for checking on object, the ultimate object on hierarchy that everyone inherits from. Okay, but I'm gonna put a wrench in those words. I'm gonna say now, employee inherits from person. Meaning, and PyCharm of course is gonna like flash where I'm doing dumb things. Ignore that flashing, ignore the man behind the curtain there or the brown, you know, brown background stuff there. Basically employees inheriting from person and all of a sudden things change. Does anything change if I just run my code now? Absolutely not. If I run my code, everything will be exactly as before. We're printing hello name one, name two, hello imp one, imp two. But I have changed the inheritance search. Uh, uh, search tree. I've changed its path and I'm just going to show you one more thing and then I'm going to take questions if there are any. So basically now if I say watch this, I'm going to get rid of the greet method from employee. So now when I say e1.greet, Python says, hey e1, do you have an attribute greet on the instance? The answer is no. Well, how about your class? Does your class employee have an attribute greet on, on it? The answer is no, it's gone. I erased it. So this is, okay, I'm not giving up so fast. Does person have the attribute greet? And the answer is yes. We get back that method object and look at that. We get the same results, even though we have done no work, we've done less work. This is the first paradigm of method inheritance and it's the best one, do nothing. If you do nothing, basically it goes up to your parent, which as a father of three children, I can tell is sort of true in real life as well. Do nothing and your parents will somehow clean up and cook it. Anyway, anyway, I digress. Regardless, that's how we can use inheritance for simple stuff. Okay, Paul, any questions? We have a good number of questions. Uh, I like how you ended with parents don't control their children because, you know. Uh, first question, what theme is that? Oh no, it's 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 the default theme. Now now I'm okay. now I'm showing my 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 pie charm ignorance. I'm so sorry. Like, like I opened it up and I used it a little bit. Maybe it's the high contrast or something like that. Maybe. Oh wow. Okay, you didn't so, tell me. Uh, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> uh, so you said Dunder init isn't the constructor for those who care. Uh, do you want to just kind of point them in the right direction for what to look at for Python? help Python's protocol for object construction? Sure, so what happens is when I invoke a class here, we like to think 
that um, it's using Dunder in it, but it's actually calling something called Dunder new. That's the real constructor. And that basically gets whatever arguments we passed. It creates the object. And then I always like to say, so, so here, let's just like do it here. So I say, this is not really how Dunder new works. I mean, not how it looks, but basically it says, O equals, I call it O, like a new object equals, right? New object magic. We get back O. And then what it does is it says, okay, before, okay. Before I do anything, I'm going to say, oh, Dunder in it. I'm going to call that. So basically, that method is called by the new object. The only thing that in is supposed to do is put on attributes. That's why in it never returns a value, because we don't care if it returns a value, because its job is assignment. And then basically, after new gets that, then it says return O. So if you have no in it, by the way, what happens? Well, let's look at this structure here. We turn to O and say, do you have Dunder in it? The answer is no. We turn to its class, does it have Dunder in it? In the case of person, it does, so that's what executes. But what if it doesn't? What if we don't uh, write it under in it? It goes up to object, the ultimate object in a hierarchy, which basically does nothing. It's just a placeholder method. So if you ever want to really mess with how objects are instantiated, you can write under new. By the way, never write under new unless you really, really, really know what you're doing, um, or it's your colleague's computer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a good point. A couple of decades ago, Python introduced a whole bunch of meta class programming things where madness lies. There are some <laughs> new caps that let you scratch some of this itch without um, going fully into meta class programming. That's too in depth for this webinar, so we'll leave it at that. Um, I'll ask a couple of questions and then come back. Uh, greet. So the question was, so greet is basically a static method. And in a way, even though Python does have the decorator for static method and another decorator for class method, in a way, they oh. are, right? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I disappeared for a few moments. I'm back now. Yeah. Sorry, I clicked on the wrong button. No problem. No problem. Uh, so in a way, it is a static method because it's being passed in self and, you know, it... it it, it syntactically looks different like an instance method, but the line between the two isn't that firm, right? Well, between this sort of method and a static method? Well, a static method, from, from my interpretation and understanding, is one that doesn't require any uh, state from the object. And here right. we actually do have state, right? We have self.name. So if we were just like, if I had like a method here, like, you know, def five self, right? And then say return five. Oh, share the screen. Sorry, 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 sorry. That's what happens when I press the wrong button. Everything goes haywire. Da, 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 da. I'm staring at my screen, but where did my, uh oh, where did, oh, I know, because I'm, you were oh, full goodness. screen, yes. Swipe, I was full screen. Right. So, so swipe I, right. okay. So, I actually don't, oh. Okay, let's do this again. Hold on a second. <laughs> Stop screen share. I'll get that. Uh, so, how do I do that? I never remember which keys it is. Oh, goodness. Does anyone remember? Uh, so maybe right click in the doc and say. Oh, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am a professional, folks. All right. Watch this. Uh, oh, for crying. Oh, wait. So I have to like do that in the doc again. There we go. Hi. You got to be kidding me. Okay. Let's drop this again. Sorry. Let's just do this one more time here. No problem. Okay, I'm going to unfull screen it. Aha, then we share it. Maybe the full screen idea is dumb. That was my suggestion, for the audience. It's my fault. There we go. Okay, I'm going to keep this here. So basically, if I were to create a new method here, five self return five, so like greed is a regular method, but if I do this, this here will work, right? This method five, and I can say p1.5, p2.5, that'll work fine. Um, but this doesn't depend on the state of self. It doesn't use self at all. So I would call right. that more of a static method. And in fact, if you mouse over the squiggly, PyCharm is telling you. Ta-da! Method 5 may be static. That's right. Yep. Okay, so onward, related to that, um, as far as the objects that are being, the inst I'm sorry, the classes that are being constructed and the methods that are on them, the question is, if you look at employee.greet as a symbol and person.greet as a symbol, if you ran Python's ID function on each of those, it would be equal? It would Ooh. think it was the same object because the function class thingy is an object. 
Let me, okay, first I'm going to think about it, and then I'm going to try it. Um, okay. So basically, first of all, if we say now employee.greet, so person.greet does mm -hmm. exist, and it'll be seen as a function. It'll be seen as a function object. It's an attribute on person. Right. Fine. But on employee, there is no greet attribute. And if you try to access it via the class, it will not find anything there. In fact, let me just uh, run up my Python console here. Oh, it's not, yeah, here we go. Am I going to have person here? I should oh, help if I type. No, nah, it doesn't. Okay, so I'm just going to like, fine, I'm just going to copy this in here. Let's see if this will work well. You can say from person or import. Oh, there we go. Oh, of course, of course. Okay. So watch this. If I now say, like, uh, let's do this, dir of person, right, we're going to see then, oh, this is like way too, okay. But if we look a little, you know, keep scrolling, keep scrolling, keep scrolling, we're going to see then greet. So greet is an attribute on person. But if I say the same thing here for employee, if I say dir of employee, We're not going to see greet there. Oh, we will. Or we will. There you go. So basically, so I'm wrong. Um, huh. I think because dir has some magic in it in terms of like how the attribute lookups works. Yeah, right. But basically, if I, if I were to say like, and so let's try this now. So ID of person and ID of, uh, oh, sorry, not ID of person, ID of person greet and ID of employee greet. Yeah, so they are actually there. So, so it's fine. Yep. So they are, and they are for, the for same people idea. who do kind of closure style programming, if you wanted to stupidly store attributes on the function, oh my God. it's the same function. So whether you're getting it from a subclass or the parent class, it's going to be the same function. All right, cool. Uh, so that answers that uh, question. When is it a good idea to write uh, Dunder new? Um, if you have a lot of, I'll, I'll take a stab at this because I've been, I briefly thought about <laughs> doing this on my registry. If you have some custom logic on the construction of classes, not the initialization of classes, and you want to control object construction, or perhaps uh, raise exceptions if certain things are detected then you could get into the Dunder new if you wanted to like stamp on methods dynamically at runtime and make something that felt like a different object, you might want to do things like that. Uh, but let's not get too far. Um, actually, I'll put it out to the channel. Uh, if any of you have heroically but stupidly screwed around with Dunder new, post what you did. Um, there was a joke from Jurgen that uh, you got squigglies because you didn't use foo bar and baz. Which was a, uh, <laughs> I think it's because of my spacing, actually. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was a joke from Ruven's Twitter this morning about only old people like us use those. Um, okay, um, there's a question related to design patterns, recommendations for best resources. Uh, on design patterns and methods and, and, and inheritance. So basically, the topic that you're talking about today, any intersection with design patterns? To some degree. I mean, design patterns are, once you have the two types of relationships among object classes, inheritance and, um, oh, 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 how am I missing this? And, uh, is it has a, I remember it in a moment. Boy, I'm really blanking today. Once you have those two, what do you do with them? So today we're really using sort of talking about the nuts and bolts of how you do it. And design patterns are then, okay, given these composition, given that you have inheritance and composition, how can you then use them in different combinations to solve common problems? So like, if I want to have a whole lot of classes inherit from my class, how can I design my class so it's easy to inherit from and people can have like, you know, set up and tear down and that sort of stuff. Um, so they're all, so that's what the design patterns are for, but they assume that you have a, a real fluency with these sorts of things that are going on. And, uh, for the audience, this is a big debate and lots of big systems in Python, like the thing that I was involved in called Zope and then Django and other things are very mix in inheritance space and learned their lessons. 
And so big inheritance hierarchies got a bad name and composition was viewed as a solution for that, leading to a troll tweet from Hennick this morning aimed at this <laughs> webinar about inheritance. Pretty funny. Not going to lie. He has a point. Okay. Is it a good <laughs> idea to update the class attributes by using self.dunderdict.update? Now, I believe that question is malformed because they said class attributes. Um, well, I mean, class attributes are on, I think, Dunderdict in the class, but I I would not do that. I really, yeah. I, 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 dis, I dislike that a lot. I mean, if you're going to, class attributes are um, great in many ways, but can be problematic if you don't know how to work with them. Um, mm -hmm. And so making them even more problematic by sort of making them more obscure to, to read and write, I think is going to just gonna sort of add to the trouble. Yep. And uh, if you write tests, you will hate yourself for mutating the class because you'll have to put it back in its original state. Um, Elias points out if you mouse over line 43 where it's yelling at you for the dunder init, yeah. we are reminding um Ruben that he didn't make a call to the super so he uh Elias correctly spotted that I have some other questions but I've been talking too much let me turn it back over to you and save those for later all right and by the way we, we will be getting to dunder in it now so okay, great uh, <laughs> all right so we've got our person class and we've got our employee class and things seem to be working okay. Like I'm, you know, I'm pretty happy with what I got. Let me just like format this a little bit more so we can like see a little more on the screen at the time. But, but I look at what I've got here and I say, wait a second. If the whole point of working with objects is to reduce, like you know, uh, is to you know, reduce repetition, then I have that repetition here because in line 39, to the init of employee is assigning self.name equals name. And I have up here, when I'm creating person, I'm just going to get rid of this five method here, right? I'm also saying self.name equals name. Now, people who come from a background of like Java or C Sharp or something say that's ridiculous. We shouldn't be repeating ourselves. What we should do is we should get rid of this line because at the end of the day, right, employee inherits from person, person's in it is setting name, and thus employees in it doesn't need to set name because it's going to happen from above. Now you'll notice that it's like still brown, still squiggly, still giving you all sorts of trouble. So PyCharm has figured out to some degree what's going on here. Let's run in and see what happens. And the answer is we get an error. But what error do we get? Well, it looks like we were able to create our person objects. Hello name one, hello name two. That worked just great. So where did it die? Where did it cause problems? It gives us this problem here. Here we go return hello self.name. So it's inside of the greet method, as it says here, employee object has no attribute name, meaning that we were able to create our employee objects. They do exist. We managed to get through lines 38 and 39 where we created them. And the error occurred then in line 41 where we tried to greet the employee. Now, I know, I know that where you work, you might feel like you have no name, but this is a different sort of problem that we're experiencing here in our program. And so the problem is what? The problem is that we were able to create this, this employee, but they didn't have a name. So what's going on? Well, let's think about it. When I create my new instance of employee, what happens? And we just talked about this before, right? Dunder new creates the new object. It then turns to Dunder in it. So it turns and says, hey, does E1 have a Dunder in it? The answer is no. So it says, okay, does E1's class, we can say type of E1, does it have a Dunder in it? The answer is yes. And that's it. We find that Dunder in it. This method runs. End of story. And so those of you who come from languages in which a class is the sort of blueprint, and so we would see a merger of the attributes or the fields or whatever you want to call them between person and employee, that's not how it works in Python. In Python, every single attribute needs to be added. And the, the role of init, once again, is to add those attributes. So if our Dunder in it runs here in employee, great but it's not gonna automatically run Dunder in it of person. So how can we solve this? Well, one solution of course, is to say self.name equals name. We could do that and thus repeat our code, but you really don't wanna do that because I wanna basically say that an employee is just like a person, but with some distinctions. So instead what I can do is I can call in it in person. And there are a few different ways to do that. 
One is to say, person, gender in it, of uh, self name. That's right. I can call that method explicitly. And this was for a while like the, the way to do it. Why? Because in it is just a method. And if it's a method, actually, I call it on the class, it's just a plain old function. So I have to do all this sort of heavy lifting myself. I go to the class, I call Dunder in it, I pass itself, and myself will be the new instance of employee, and I pass it to person Dunder in it, and it then adds the attribute name, returns. We don't care about the return value because it's the, uh, it's the uh, sort of settings that are important. It sets the name, and all is good. And now if I run things, it'll work great. There we go. Our employees have names again. The thing is, this is kind of ugly. In fact, this is really ugly. And you're really not supposed to be calling these sorts of methods quite like this, even though you can. Anything with a dunder, it's like it's supposed to happen in the background without this sort of thing. So instead, what I can do is I can use super. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, for those of you with any experience with Python 2 back in the olden days, super was terrible. Like Super nowadays is way smarter and better, but it also is different from what other languages do very often. In many other languages, if you call super, what it's basically going to do, what language will do is find, oh, okay, I'm in Dunder init. I'm going to automatically call Dunder init in the parent. I'm going to call like the parallel method up above, or I guess the superior method above. That's not what it does in, in Python. And Python super basically gives us this proxy that will figure out which is the first class that should then be have in it called on. So I'm going to say super, Dunder, I do say Dunder init, and then I just say name. I don't actually have to pass self because super is that smart. It's really quite super. Okay, anyway. So basically, when I do this now, I run it, things work again. Moreover, if and when I ever add new stuff to the person class, that will automatically be added into my employee class because we are inheriting from it. And here, obviously, I'm in charge of both of these classes. A lot of inheritance has to do with what if I'm not on the team or not in the company or don't have the code available of the class from which I want to inherit. I'm sort of stuck with what they're doing. And so by using super, I can depend on what they're doing and then do my own thing. So this is sort of, um, this is paradigm number two. And the paradigm number two is mix it, like mix, mix it up. Not mix it, but like let's mix it up. A little bit of inheritance and a little bit of our own thing. Now it's important that we first do super. Let the parent do what they want. That's what I tell my kids. Let the parent do what they want. And then after the parent is done doing all of its assignment, then we will do our custom stuff here down below. And if we want to override it or check it or change it, we can do that then. This allows us really to, to override what's happening there. Okay, questions, comments until here. Okay, uh, first one is, a question recommending any good books or material about classes and inheritance in Python while you don't, don't answer yet. Wait. <laughs> so I asked Ivan if he wanted a small book or a big book. This is not the small book option, but Luciano, our friend Luciano uh, has written a tremendous book. I think there might be a second edition. I've got the first edition. So this covers, fortunately, your question. Unfortunately, 400 cubic tons besides your question. So Ruben, do you have anywhere that you appoint anyone for um, follow-up material? Um. Look, the, the, the basics and sort of practicing it, I've got in my book, um, in uh, a Python workout. Um, but in terms of like higher level, sort of how to use objects in more sophisticated ways, I'll tell you, I haven't seen a lot out there. Um, I've actually been developing a course on, someone mentioned before, design patterns, design patterns in Python. Um, not because they're uncontroversial, but because so many of my clients said, we really want to know about this, even so that we can reject them afterwards. But we just want to know like what people are talking about and what what is like, you know, what are these uh, buzzwords? But I'm trying to think, I don't know of any great place to go for object-oriented Python stuff. I'll, I'll think about it some more, but sure. no good suggestions. It's certainly true that the simple stuff is so simple, it requires little explanation. The intermediate stuff gets a little weird, like multiple inheritance and things like that. And then when you start talking about, hey, I want to poke around in the MRO, um, <laughs> in, in in the what Python is doing behind the scenes, you're going to bump into, hey, Python, it's a pretty old language. 
Uh, okay, next up. Um, is it okay to invoke another function of the class inside the Dunder init? This is a good question. For example, to automatically connect to a database when creating an object of the class. I think that's a great example. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 was, I mean, look, again, you have to remember the purpose of Dunder init is to set attributes. And if so, setting if setting an attribute is going to be complex or weird or like something you might want to do at other times, like let's say you get, I love this example, like let's say you get disconnected from the database, you want to automatically reconnect. So you don't want to just have that functionality in Dunder in it. Yeah, I'd, I'd say totally go for it. Yep. This becomes a style thing. And a lot of people say have skinny in it and then make people construct the object and then call a method after for post construction stuff. If you distrust that extra logic and you want to make sure you can construct the object, um, other people say to do exactly what uh, Peter was saying, because you can then test that other stuff somewhat independently of the Dunder init. You can write a test that constructs just the part that connects to the database or something like that. So you'll see a lot of patterns in small projects, medium projects, big projects on this topic. I personally am kind of of the camp of don't have really long dunder inits when there's 10 lines that are gr basically grouped, I would move them to something else. Especially if they're not going to be number. part of the inheritance. Actually, oh, ooh, that's a good point. If that logic that's in the Dunder init, you want to be customizable through inheritance, move it out so you can override that method. That makes sense to me, absolutely. All right, great. Um, okay, uh, let's see. If we, In the case of the employee class, can we just ignore Dunder init? So the answer is, as always with me, yes and no. If you don't have a Dunder in it, what you're saying is, I don't want to set up any special attributes. Now, in the case of employee, you probably don't want that. Indeed, in the case that I set up here, you can't have that because we have an extra attribute, ID number, that you could, in theory, in theory, not have a Dunder in it on employee, and then create your employee, have the Dunder in it of person do its thing, and then stick an extra ID number attribute onto your employee uh, instances. That is technically fine. Like, as I like to say, unfortunately, that works, right? Like, it will, <laughs> it will technically work, and all of your colleagues will hate you because it makes the code just, like, completely yeah, unreadable, sure. right? So, so, like, you can, but don't. Um, again, if you don't have Dunder in it, you're basically talking about a class that has functionality that's different from the parent, but not data that's different from a parent, which, which can exist, but it's rarer. Right, and um, that idea of just sharing logic is a thing, but I just use the words is a, and you've taken something out of the parent that is part of the meaning of is a. I mean, can you really have a person without a name or something? Probably not. Yeah, but if, if Dunder init is not there, then it will just sort of default to the parent classes Dunder init. So it'll go to par person init. So it will have a name. It just won't have anything that distinguishes like employee and person will data wise. Oh, sorry, I was thinking parent, uh, the parent class not having the Dunder init. He meant the subclass not having the Dunder. Oh, right. oh, yeah. It, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, let me reply to this one. Um, a couple of other questions before getting you moving back. These are things that popped up for me. Do you ever see anyone not use the letters S E L F for the first argument of a method? There's no magic, there's no magic to that, but no one in recorded history has chosen a different name. So here, here's the story that I, that I tell people by courses, which is yes, self is a convention. It is not required. It is not a keyword in Python. If you want to, you could use any other word, even one like, oh, I don't know, to pick a totally crazy one that no one would ever use, this, right? Clearly no self-respecting self language would use such a word to identify the current Surely object. Not. <laughs> Surely um, and not. Self, and self demonstrates that while it's not a huge amount of influence, there was definitely influence from the small talk language on Python. That's why we have Dunder New and Dunder in it that they're split up. 
but like, whereas in small talk and in Ruby, self is a magic word. In Python, it's just a convention. That said, I, I think I've seen some diehard like C++ and Java people use this. And I try, like, but it's super rare. And they basically mm -hmm. get steamrolled by all their colleagues and by everyone else to, to realizing this is just dumb. Yeah, right, right. So one last thing that I'll mention, uh, this is from your intro about why do we need classes? Can't we just use dicks and stuff like that? And one thing I'll add, it's a little bit beyond the scope maybe of this, but just to plant a seed, the rise of static analysis tools in Python, things like MyPy. When you commit to this regime of ISA and try to write your code to model that, these tools can pick up when you're being naughty and not nice because of typing relationships. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. I'll ask one more question that just came in, hand it back over to you. Uh, what is the fun, what is the purpose of self on the code super and then in parens two arguments, parent class comma self. I believe oh. the answer to that is it's yeah. the implicit argument for the instance that is being used for self. That's right. That's right. Back back in you know olden times, you actually had to say super of employee, employee, and self. And yeah. I found this made it super, so to speak, annoying to use. <laughs> like, really, who wants to do that? And like, yeah. you would stare at it and say, "I'm in the class employee, dummy. I'm in like I've got self. Like, how can this not be figured out?" Now, I don't know what magic they did in order to get it to understand that implicitly, because I understand it wasn't necessarily easy. But this is why I'm such a big fan of super in Python right. three because you don't need to pass that. It's all implicitly handled, and then just works. Yeah, and if you look to the person asking the question, you look on line 35, this method has a first argument of self. So you have to give it the thing that the method is operating on. And so the self in the super would be the thing that you're operating on. Fortunately, now it's implicit. You don't have to do it anymore. That's it for the questions. Back to number three. Okay. So we've seen now two paradigms so far. One is the do nothing paradigm. Like I didn't have greet. And so it just percolated up all the way to uh, top level. And the second one is this mixed method. But there's a third way to do it as well. And that third paradigm is to override a method. That I want to have a method of exactly the same name and probably the same function signature, but in the subclass. And that's going to be called instead. So let's say, let's just say that people at our company are super nice to one another. So I can have a def greet here and it's gonna have self as well, right? But then I'm gonna return something instead. I'm not gonna call super. I'm not gonna do anything like that. I'm gonna say like, well, we'll let's say like, you know, with stars in here, you know, hello, fellow employee, self.name. Stars and unicorns and everything, right? And so now when I run this, Right, we're going to see that I've called the same method exactly. We never ever call person.greet on an employee because what's happening? I say e1.greet. Once again, we go through our, our order here with attributes. We turn to e1, do you have greet? The answer is no. We turn to e1's class, do you have greet? The answer is yes. That's where it stops. First, you know, the first one that we find wins. And so we never even get up to person.greet. Is that a problem? No, uh, assuming you know what you're doing, assuming you know that you want to override the functionality here, you can. And it can be something as simple as this, but let's take something a little more interesting. What if I say here, print E1 and print E2? Well, now, like that's kind of weird, right? Well, look at this. We get back when we print objects, we get this horrific looking thing. I really like, I don't know, for years and years, years they haven't improved this in Python, what can you do? I don't know, what can I do? I can complain about it. In any event, when you print an object, this is what you get back, main employee object at, and then you know what this is? That's right, it's location and memory. What can you do with that? Absolutely, positively nothing because we don't have direct access to memory, but here's a cool little tidbit. That's the ID number of the object, right? It's just in hex and that's where it's located in memory. There you go. But let's say I want to do something a little nicer with it. Well, what I can do is I can say, I can think about what's happening. When I, what happens when I print E1? Well, actually what's going on is saying print stir of E1. 
Well, that doesn't really help anyone, right? Well, actually, what happens then is it's really doing print e1.dunderstir. It's really calling the dunderstir method. Now we go through our search again. Does e1 have stir? The answer is no. Does e1's class employee have stir? The answer is no. Does e1's class's parent uh, person have stir? The answer is no. So who has it? Object, the ultimate object in our hierarchy, and that is why all objects in Python that don't aren't otherwise, uh, you know, don't have anything to under, separate to understand. That's why they're all printed out in this horrifically ugly way. Well, if I want to, I can change that. I can say def understand, and then I can say return. You know, I am a person. I can say I'm an employee. Name self dot name id self dot id number. And now when I print out my people, my people, like I'm their leader or something, right, we see that printing them out works this way. And so this is a more typical way that we're going to want to override. And this is why just about everyone overrides Dunderstir. By the way, we also overrode Dunder in it, right? We just don't think about it in that sense because it's not getting up to object. And so we, we sort of hijack the call at a lower level. Once you understand these three paradigms, though, like I'm going to override completely, I'm going to do nothing and use the parent. I'm going to do some sort of mix. Now it's a matter of how do you want to mix and match your classes. Questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, one question. Um, describe your book, Python Workout, uh, who it's for, what they'll learn. Who is it for? Well, first of all, let's see. I have a copy. I used to, ah, here we go. Ta -da. It's actually a real physical book. Kids, remember these from like the museums? In any event, so <laughs> Python Workout. Um, so basically, when I would teach classes, uh, people would often ask me, OK, I've had this class, but there's still a gap between finishing a course and the work I want to do. And I need practice. I don't want to be practicing on my work stuff. Like, my boss probably won't like that so much. So how can I improve my fluency? And so Python Workout is, technically speaking, 50 exercises to improve your Python skills. Um, Actually, each exercise has three bonus exercises. It's really about 200 exercises um, with screencasts, with Jupyter Notebooks that you can download and look at. Um, and I'm really happy with it. Uh, other people seem to be happy with it, too. And I'm now working on a new book. Um, I'm now about 10% through called Pandas Workout. Same thing, just with Pandas instead of Python. But if you basically have taken a course with Python, if, you're, if you've been using Python, I would say for less than eight months or so, day to day, then you will almost certainly like find some tidbits in here that'll help you to uh, do your work faster and better. It's interesting. The author of either the first or second Python book, Mark Hammond, big Windows Python guy back in the day, wrote an O'Reilly book about programming Windows with Python. And his lesson from that experience was you could make more money mowing yards. <laughs> I believe the Python uh, ecosystem and market has gotten bigger with several zeros since then. What was your experience writing a book? Was it a positive one? So I wrote a book 20 years ago about Pearl. Um, and the book got really good reviews oh, and yeah. sold. It was, it and was sold. a go-to book back in the day. Oh yeah, except no one bought it. <laughs> so I was a little hesitant. Um, also the publisher at that time that I worked with was really difficult to work with. I've had only the most wonderful experience working with Manning. They are so, like, I just can't praise them enough. They've been so great. Right. Um, their, their editing is great. They give me good suggestions and so forth. It is true. It is true that you don't write a book to make lots of money because like the time you put into it um, is a lot like I'm pandas workout. I'm working at it all week. And basically I'm doing about one exercise a day. So, or maybe like one and a half a day. So if you figure 50 exercises, that's going to cost me like, you know, a month's worth of work. Are they really giving me a month's worth of salary from my book? Yes. If you all buy it and buy hundred copies for your friends, but uh, in, in back in the real world, no. But I'll tell you, I learned so much just in the last few days from working on writing and working through it. I think that, you know, you, you always hear this and it's true. Teaching forces you to think through it and forces you to learn oh, things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my God. I've learned so much about pandas just in the last few days, um, just from writing the book. So on that front, it's 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 a win. It's a win for my future. Uh, that's future another future. comment Mark made was uh, he was so embarrassed by his Win32 code when writing the book that he made all these major improvements. Okay, last question, then we'll head out for a conclusion. Um, when would the instance have the attribute rather than its classes attribute? So in the case when it has the attribute, is it a valid use case? 
how would you go about assigning it instance.adder equals some function? If not, why look up there first? Not sure oh, because that. so I think I think I understand what you are. So so look, Py Python has this system for looking up attributes um, because it makes it relatively straightforward and simple. Like basically, once you have object and once you have um, uh, what's it called a type in Python, and you have the variable lookup rules and you have the attribute lookup rules. That's basically the object system. You don't need much more than that. Um, it's like amazing, amazing that these four simple things together can actually do it for you. And so by making classes objects and by making attributes work in this way, it makes the, the system simpler and more consistent. That means though that attributes can be on an instance, in which case it's basically gonna be data, or they can be on a class in which case they can either be data or a method. But methods always sit on a class. They never sit on an instance. You can play with it that way, but don't do it. And the magic sure. rewriting itself won't happen on an instance. Something that is a pattern is data on methods, uh, which is a pattern in writing um, decorators that accumulate data whenever they're called, uh, for example, timing functions and things like that. Um, all right, so I think that gives a good enough explanation. Milan, if I didn't get it right, uh, give us another question. We'll try and answer it. Let's head it back over to my screen and we will do a wrap up. All right, great. Uh, Ruben, fun hanging out with you. Thanks for giving us a strong basis in understanding inheritance in Python. I could have talked about this stuff all day long. I appreciate it. Uh, remember, you can get lots of content from Ruben whether it's bite-sized chunks from Twitter where I consume a lot of his stuff. It's cool. It's kind of in serial form. So he'll do a tweet and then he's like writing a thriller in like five tweets later, you'll find out who the villain is. Um, he also in YouTube, uh, some old fashioned email newsletters for old folks like me. Uh, if you have any of the questions later, just reach out to us, the PyCharm team, by email or social media. If you tweet at us, I'll probably be the one to reply to you. And if I don't know the answer, which is probably could, could happen, I know how to read Proven and I can do the hard work for answering it. If you have any questions or want more information on PyCharm, please go to our website at jetbrains.com slash PyCharm. If you haven't already, check out our blog where you can find up-to-date PyCharm news. Stuff's going to start happening. We're getting into our release cycle. Uh, going to be doing some events uh, in addition to educational resources such as this webinar. We love your feedback on this webinar, so feel free to contact us on Twitter or we'll, if you registered for this, uh, fill in the after webinar survey. We actually read this stuff, try to figure out how we can get better, other things that we should talk about. So that's all from us today. Thank you to our esteemed guest and even more our esteemed viewers. Thank you for joining us. Hope you have a nice day.